Hello and welcome to the Pensacola Bay Living Shoreline Project 60% Design Update. Uh, I am Matt Posner with the Scandia County Natural Resources Department. I'm the Restore Program Manager and the Project Manager uh, for the Pensacola Bay Living Shoreline Project. Today we're joined by uh, Dr. Brett Webb from South Coast Engineers out of Fairhope, Alabama, uh, the lead coastal engineer on the project, and he'll be giving the 60% Design Update. So with that, I'll turn it over to Brett. Thank you, Matt. So a little bit of uh, an orientation to what we're doing uh, today. We'll, we'll start with a brief overview of the project, uh, just to remind everybody what it is that we're, we're talking about. Uh, we'll have a review of the 60% design plans uh, as they stand now. A brief discussion on the modeling activities that were, uh, that were done to inform the design of the sites, uh, and then conclude with uh, uh, a few points on next steps. Just to remind everybody uh, a little bit about the project, uh, this is the Pensacola Bay Living Shoreline Project, uh, and its goal is to enhance and protect approximately three miles of the shoreline at three different sites along Pensacola Bay. The project includes the design and construction of breakwaters uh, that will be used to reduce wave energy uh, that would be impacting the shorelines and the new habitats that would be created as part of the project. The creation, protection, and or enhancement of emergent marsh, submerged aquatic vegetation, and sandy shoreline habitat. And then to enhance force protection at uh, Pensacola NAS for the sites that uh, abut or border uh, their upland property. There were some substantial changes to the project sites as a result of the 2020 hurricane season. And there were some significant design modifications required at Site C, uh, which is closest to the pass, uh, as a result of Tropical Storm Cristobal, Hurricane Sally, Hurricane Zeta, and potentially other storms during the season that impacted the shoreline, the landscape, and the upland infrastructure at NAS Pensacola. In terms of critical habitat for Gulf sturgeon, that's another consideration uh, that we've incorporated into the design of the project, uh, where the majority of in-water activities are proposed between the shoreline and, and water depths of less than about six feet. Uh, we are bringing in clean stone uh, materials and native plantings uh, to use as part of the project in addition to clean sand fill. Uh, and there will be numerous gaps provided between the, the subtitle breakwaters and the emergent breakwaters to allow for flushing and species movement back and forth, ingress and egress between the habitats and, and the larger bay environment. The location of submerged aquatic vegetation in two of the project sites, and those are sites B and C as we'll see later, uh, submerged aquatic vegetation here, what we mean is seagrasses, and sometimes that's abbreviated as SAV. Those locations have been incorporated into the projects to uh, make sure that we are avoiding direct impacts uh, to the existing seagrasses and also incorporated in a way as to hopefully allow the existing seagrasses to expand over time due to reduced wave energy and more stable bottom sediments. The breakwaters, both emergent and subtitle, will be set back from these seagrass beds uh, to avoid direct impacts as will any clean sand fill brought in to establish new sandy shoreline and or marsh habitat. Other design considerations uh, that we had uh, had to include along the way, uh, which ultimately ended up modifying or, or you know, changing the, the project design, would be the bird airstrike hazard or BASH concerns at Pensacola NAS. And so some of the detailing in Site C, uh, that site closest to the pass and also closest to one of the NIS runways, uh, those details were modified in order to address some of these comments and, and or, in order to avoid any attractive nuisance uh, that might be created that would attract large uh, birds to the project site. There'd be no vegetation plantings proposed at Site C as part of the project. Uh, in order to you know, min minimize um, you know, the, the attractive nuisance for the birds. Uh, but of course, natural vegetation will, will grow in these sites over time in the upland. 
In terms of sources of fill material for creating these habitats uh, at each one of the sites, we'll use material recovery around White Island or Site A. Uh, the geotechnical investigation showed appropriate fill material uh, adjacent to that site with good characteristics. And the dredging plan right now uh, completely balances the volume of material needed to construct the emergent marsh habitat and the emergent upland island habitat to recreate White Island. Uh, so we'll be able to essentially balance the need of sand with what is available around that site today. For sites B and C, uh, we'll be taking material out of the Robertson Island, Admirals Island, Sand Island, uh, uh, United States Army Corps of Engineers uh, disposal area. And that material will be removed from that disposal area and then beneficially reused uh, to create these habitats and shorelines at the other sites. Uh, that uh, disposal area has more than enough material uh, and uh, to, to build out these projects to 100%. Also, in terms of authorization for impacting submerged lands, uh, we'll be conducting a new mean high water line survey um, to reflect the activity and changes uh, brought on by the 2020 hurricane season. Uh, and in terms of uh, public interest um, for the project, uh, we will be dredging no more than required for the project. Uh, so complete balance between dredging and recovery of material and material needed to build the projects is of utmost importance. We'll also uh, briefly address the potential impact to sea level rise on these projects and how they've been incorporated into the project design. Starting first with the 60% uh, design plans for site A, uh, which is White Island. Uh, this will be at the north end of the, the project area. And so just to zoom in there, we'll be focusing on this kind of red hatched area. And the orientation of some of these pictures or photos uh, or figures will change from slide to slide uh, to better represent the detail uh, in that particular image. So we'll, we'll make sure we uh, orient you to uh, the image that you're seeing on the slide moving forward. The focus and goals for this particular site at White Island is to maximize the habitat benefits in terms of emergent marsh, uh, beach and dune for White Island itself, uh, and then the potential enhancement of uh, SAV or seagrass habitat, and then the structures themselves uh, and also the marshes will be excellent habitat for juvenile and larger finfish species. Uh, that would be of uh, recreational importance for the Pensacola Bay complex. One of the goals is really to reestablish some appropriate footprint and volume of sand within White Island. Uh, through the placement of sand and the establishment of appropriate native vegetation. And so in the marshes, that vegetation would generally include Spartina alterniflora, um, Juncus romerianus, which typically we refer to in its common name as black needle rush, and then at higher elevations, uh, Spartina patens, which is another type of uh, smooth cord grass, which is very salt hardy. Uh, Spartina patens and, and other upland type vegetations, which exist at higher elevations, would be targeted for White Island and some of the others for the emergent marshes. Now, those vegetation species play in a very important role. Uh, not only do they provide habitat uh, for fin fish, but also birds in the uplands, but they're also very important for managing and retaining the newly placed sediments. Uh, so the root systems uh, within these uh, marsh or vegetation um, species are very effective at holding uh, that soil in place. And the upland vegetations are very important for blown sand to make sure that you're uh, retaining that material on your project. Some design features uh, focus on maximizing the long-term viability of the project. Uh, by keeping that sand in place, not only the vegetation will do that, but also the emergent and submerged breakwaters uh, and other features will be used uh, to make sure that those habitats and newly placed areas of sand uh, 
uh, stay there throughout the project life. For White Island specifically, uh, one of the goals is to continue to provide managed access to that site uh, and to a certain degree provide recreational opportunities in and around the emergent marsh complex areas. This is an overview of the engineering plans for Site A or White Islands. And we'll focus on each one of these elements in a little bit more detail. Uh, but generally speaking, the, the green um, curve-shaped areas are your emergent marsh areas. Uh, the areas outlined in yellow uh, would be mostly uh, clean sand fill and upland sand beach and dune areas for White Island. The blue elements are structures. Uh, so the blue ones are emergent rock structures and the curved uh, bright green areas are submerged breakwaters. The orientation here now is uh, north is to the right and so Pensacola Bay would be at the bottom of this image uh, and Davenport Bayou would be kind of in the upper part, uh, upper right portion of the image. Uh, and then Pensacola NAS in, in the Navy Channel there would be to the left. And so what we're looking at here is uh, essentially tidal creeks uh, bisecting these marsh complexes. And these tidal creeks are important for, uh, you know, water drainage and flushing through the site for ingress and egress of um, uh, finfish uh, and, and other species but also could serve as paddling trails for people on paddle boards and kayaks. There would be uh, dredged areas in between the marsh complexes in White Island uh, and also on the west side of White Island to allow for that managed access uh, to be able to reach White Island uh, with appropriate navigable depths. And part of the navigation there really is the byproduct of, of sediment recovery to build the project. The red line that we're tracing uh, through this plan, we're gonna see in detail in the next slide uh, in cross section. And so this is what some of those constructed design elements look like where west is to the left and east is to the right. So Pensacola Bay would be on the right side. And what you see in these areas moving from left to right, uh, the gray areas are uh, sediment that would be removed uh, by way of dredge uh, and recovered for the purpose uh, and beneficial reuse of that sediment to build the project elements. Uh, then we would have the, the yellow polygon there is showing the emergent or uplift portions of White Island. Uh, and then we have another dredge area and then moving um, to the right on that image we get into some of the marsh complexes uh, where the yellow areas are your kind of ab above water fill areas. Uh, and also showing the, the vegetation uh, that would be uh, incorporated into those marsh complexes. Moving still further to the right, uh, you get a sense for the scale and the locations of the submerged breakwaters, uh, the proposed emergent breakwaters, uh, and then again, another uh, navigation access channel uh, whose material would be used uh, to build certain elements of the project. So that red line that we had traced on the preceding image, uh, that is essentially what you're looking at from left to right in cross section view. Now, if we take a look at some of those elements, uh, structural elements in a little bit more detail, the purpose of these rock structures, both the emergent breakwaters and the submerged breakwaters is to reduce wave energy to the point where the vegetation that's planted or naturally recruited to the sites uh, would be resilient to wave energy during normal conditions and also during uh, the frequent but lesser intense uh, tropical storms and, and moderate or minor hurricanes uh, that we seem to uh, get in our area of the Gulf Coast with a, a fairly frequent basis. So these structures on, on the left, uh, upper left, you're looking at the emergent breakwater cross section where the top width would be about six feet the top elevation of that structure would be about four feet above uh, the survey datum uh, or about two and a half feet above the mean high water tidal datum. 
Uh, and then of course, uh, the base would vary in width depending on its location and depth at the site, uh, but generally would be somewhere in the ballpark of, of 30 to 40 feet at the base. Uh, and really that's just due to, due to the very mild sloping st um, structure uh, that's uh, comprised of, of rock uh, and uh, some geotextile under underlayment for stability. Now, if you looked at this from an overhead point of view, uh, both the emergent and submerged um, structures are curved. And the reason why they're curved, there's a technical justification for doing that, uh, but it's also for aesthetic purposes, uh, where we typically find more curved shapes in, in nature and, and, and fewer straight lines. We also have incorporated into the project in some locations uh, what we're calling rock piles. And, and these are emergent structures that are, are again, built of stone, uh, but they have a, a much smaller footprint. So they are seven feet in diameter at the surface, uh, you know, at, at their crest, and then have a, a variable width at the bottom. Um, but they are much smaller uh, in terms of length uh, than the other emergent breakwaters and are used both to attenuate or reduce wave energy, but also to promote uh, good tidal flushing of the area uh, and to allow for proper ingress and egress of species that are utilized in that area. In the lower left of this sheet, we have a, a general schematic for the planting in terms of the different zones uh, where vegetation tends to um, uh, stabilize or recruit uh, relative to various tidal datums. And so again, Spartina alterniflora, which is a species of smooth cordgrass down low, uh, the black needle rush or Juncus romarianus uh, at the, the mid to higher tide levels, and then the Spartina patens uh, or salt meadow grass at higher elevations. This is another uh, schematic again uh, of, of White Island or, or that site A project site showing all of the elements, but also with these uh, color-coded polygons in blue showing the areas that would be dredged to recover and beneficially reuse sediments at the site for uh, constructing the project elements. There is another potential area here that I've highlighted in yellow in the channel uh, to buy a grand uh, that may be dredged on an as-needed basis uh, for the contractor to um, mobilize and deploy equipment uh, into and out of this area. This is a schematic, again, with Pensacola Bay, generally at the bottom of the screen and north to the right uh, of Side A or White Island uh, with some relatively recent 2019 imagery in the background, but with a lot of the other uh, technical details removed. So you get a sense of, of scale for the project. Uh, and generally where, where things are going relative to uh, the conditions of 2019 at the time of the image. So in summary, uh, we are proposing here at White Island the construction of emergent marsh habitat, uh, enhancement of the sandy shoreline area that would be used for that, that managed recreational access, uh, the support and, and facilitation of, you know, submerged aquatic vegetation habitat or seagrasses, the emergent and submerged uh, rock breakwater structures, uh, which are used not only to reduce wave energy at the site uh, and stabilize the sediments that are there in the vegetation, but also to provide habitat for finfish uh, and other crustaceans. Preliminary estimate of sand required at the site is approximately 340,000 cubic yards. Uh, the amount of rock needed is approximately 24,000 tons. And this site in total would be looking at the creation of somewhere around the neighborhood of 60 acres of habitat across all of the categories, marsh, seagrass, and upland beach and dune system. Uh, moving on to the other sites, uh, site B here will move to the south. Uh, this is uh, just on the other side of the access channel uh, from White Island. Uh, this is a, a very long, mostly north-south oriented shoreline uh, that faces to the east. Uh, and so you're getting wave energy from Escambia Bay here and uh, some from Santa Rosa Sound. The focus and goals at this site 
uh, are again to maximize habitat benefits, but here we're looking at uh, mainly emergent marsh and seagrass habitat and also finfish habitat. There's not really an upland beach and dune component to this site. Uh, specifically here we're focusing on creating these marsh complexes uh, and the, providing the structure needed to uh, hold them in place over time. The location of these marsh complexes and the rock structures was specifically designed to assist in AS Pensacola in their force protection uh, by siting the structures along the existing 500 foot exclusion zone or buffer zone. So this will create a, a very real vis visible and physical presence along that buffer zone uh, to help NAS Pensacola uh, keep uh, large recreational vessels out of that area. They'll also be used to stabilize the upland shoreline by providing the habitat in front of it and also the structures uh, and thereby reducing sediment inputs into the bay uh, from uh, excessive upland erosion and uh, through storm action and or uh, erosion through uh, upland stormwater runoff. Design features here focus on maximizing long-term viability of the project by keeping that sand in place, um, not only through the use of the structures, but also through the incorporation of marsh vegetation uh, that will hold or lock that sand in place. Again, we'll start with uh, kind of the over, uh, overhead view of the site details. Uh, again, north is to the right in this image in Pensacola Bay is at the bottom of the screen. Uh, what we have here are the marsh complexes uh, that are outlined generally in, in yellow with some detailing in green and black. The emergent uh, breakwater and other rock pile structures that are in blue. Uh, and the bright green elements are the submerged breakwaters that generally are oriented uh, in between uh, the emergent breakwaters. We'll uh, again kind of do the same thing that we did for White Island. We'll look at one of these profiles as a representative profile and cross section. And then we'll kind of zoom in on some of these elements in a little bit more detail. Uh, because of the, the length of the site here, we're gonna break this up into a north and a south segment. And so the first segment we'll look at in more detail is this north area in the red dashed box. And if we zoom in on that, we'll see each one of these features in a little bit more detail. Again, we'll have uh, tidal creeks and open water in between the marsh complexes not only for flushing, but also for ingress and egress of species. Here, this is not uh, recreational uh, waterways or activity areas since it is within the exclusion or buffer zone. Moving now to a south segment to see some of those details um, a little bit better. We see here some of these pink areas uh, that are showing up. Those are existing seagrass beds that have been surveyed back in 2019. And so the new marsh complex areas are intentionally designed to keep a fairly healthy buffer away from those existing seagrass areas uh, to avoid direct impacts. But all of the open water in between these marsh complexes, because of the emergent and submerged breakwaters and the wave attenuation that they'll provide, uh, will lead to lower wave energy uh, and more stable bottom sediments and could help facilitate the expansion of these seagrass beds over time. Now, if we take a representative cross section or slice uh, through our site details, like we did at White Island, we'll be able to see some of these elements in a little bit more detail, but from a different perspective. So that red line that had been traced through the image, now we're looking at um, you know, in, in profile or cross section, where west is to the left and east or Pensacola Bay is to the right. You can see the yellow area with the, the green um, shading above it would be one of your marsh complexes. And then there's a, a gap and a little bit of a space before you get to one of the emergent breakwaters. And then the 500 foot exclusion zone or buffer line or buffer zone is shown by the vertical dash line there. So all of the structures were intentionally set within the existing exclusion zone uh, so as not to uh, impact um, the, the, the bay environment. This is a schematic of the design for Site B 
uh, with some of the te technical detailing removed. Uh, but the sea existing seagrass bed areas in pink are still there uh, to show how the proposed site design directly avoids impacts to those seagrass areas, while also providing a lot of open water space for those seagrasses to expand over time. In summary for site B, uh, we've got the proposed construction of the intertidal marsh, uh, your uh, segmented breakwaters that would be emergent uh, and some that would be submerged uh, that would greatly support fin fish habitat and provide a little bit of wave attenuation um, between the gaps of the emergent breakwater structures. Uh, one of the goals here is to support and or uh, facilitate the enhancement and expansion of existing seagrass beds and the habitat that they provide at this site. A preliminary estimate of sand required at this site is approximately 175,000 cubic yards and will need approximately 30 to 33,000 tons of rock to create the emergent and submerged rock structures. At this site, the proposed project elements would create or facilitate approximately 65 acres of intertidal marsh and seagrass habitat. Moving still further south toward the pass to Site C, uh, what is also called Sherman Inlet, that generally corresponds to the red hatched area shown in the detail image on the right side of the slide. The focus and goals of this site are to maximize the habitat benefits associated with existing seagrass beds in the project area and also to enhance uh, finfish habitat through the creation of offshore submerged reefs. The structures at this site would assist NAS Pensacola and forest protection uh, through the creation of those submerged breakwaters along the exclusion zone, but slightly set slightly inside of that buffer zone so as not to impact uh, the, the navigable waters of Pensacola Bay. Stabilizing a very rapidly eroding shoreline to reduce excessive sediment input into the bay is one of the priorities uh, at this site. And by doing so, we'll also be able to enhance the protection of NAS Pensacola's upland infrastructure, including their roadway uh, and some uh, recreational areas and facilities uh, associated with the uh, or incorporated into the upland. The design features here maximize the long-term viability of the project by keeping the sand in place for as long as feasible uh, while still allowing for the ecosystem dynamics that are appropriate for that site which here are uh, you know offshore seagrass beds uh, and upland beach and dune habitat. Here's a technical overview uh, in, uh, in plan form of the project elements at the site. Uh, the bright green elements are your subtitle or submerged breakwaters uh, sit slightly inside of the exclusion zone. The blue uh, curved elements are your shore connected emergent breakwaters. Uh, so unlike at the other sites where these are constructed offshore in the water, these will actually be directly connected to the upland beach and dune system at the time of construction. And then we'll allow wave processes to naturally create beach pockets in between these, these uh, emergent shore connected breakwaters. We'll zoom in a little bit on the site here in terms of orientation, Pensacola Bay and, and east is to the right, north is up and Pensacola Pass would essentially be at the bottom uh, of this image. So south is, is um, to the bottom of the image. Like the other sites, we'll take a slice uh, through a section of our project uh, as represented by that red, red dash line. And here, northwest is to the left and southeast is to the right on this image. So Pensacola Bay would be to the right. And moving from left to right, you'll see the area um, of the proposed fill uh, to essentially enhance or advance the existing shoreline slightly bayward uh, to provide a emergent beach and shoreline system. It'll be co connected directly uh, at these proposed uh, emergent breakwaters. Moving further offshore, uh, we get to um, the green element there, which is your proposed submerged or subtitle breakwater. 
set slightly inside of the 500 foot NAS uh, buffer exclusion zone. This shows some of those project elements um, without all of the technical detailing and also highlights the pink areas which are existing SAV beds in the project area. So note that the fill that, that would be placed at the site, the structures that would be built at the site uh, would be done uh, so in a way that directly avoids impacts to the seagrass beds. And then the offshore subtidal breakwaters, uh, which are outlined in black, would be reducing wave energy impacting the site and also stabilizing the bay sediments in a way that would potentially facilitate the expansion of these seagrass beds over time. Here, the shore connected breakwaters, we often refer to as headland structures because they create artificial headlands that allow for the natural beach uh, pockets to form in between. And so that is one of the key elements of the concept at Site C, uh, as is the clean sand fill that's used to broaden and, and build back the, the upland shoreline and be a dune system, but also the creation of the offshore submerged breakwaters uh, to reduce wave energy and to, to maximize uh, seagrass and finfish habitat at the site. A preliminary estimate for sand required at the site is approximately 390,000 cubic yards. Um, that is a slightly higher estimate than we had before uh, because of the um, significant change to the, the beach and dune system that occurred during the 2020 hurricane season. We would need approximately 57,000 tons of rock needed at this site to completely build out everything as shown. A lot of that rock would go into the creation or formation of those submerged breakwaters. Here, uh, the project incorporates the creation of approximately 20 acres of sandy shoreline habitat and the facilitation of up to 28 acres of seagrass habitat behind the submerged breakwaters. Some of the resilience traits that have been incorporated into the project include uh, designing the elements to withstand a 10% uh, annual chance event. That would be a 10-year return period event. Now, the, the structural elements would actually withstand a much larger storm than that because they will be submerged um, during extreme events. Um, but the way the project elements are designed are to withstand a uh, full wave attack uh, up to and including a 10 year return period event. Uh, and then once they're submerged, uh, some of those forces uh, start to decrease and all of your habitat areas uh, would, would be underwater. Uh, and so at that point, um, uh, additional resilience mechanisms kick in uh, where the habitats are somewhat insulated from wave attack uh, due to their submergence under a, an extreme storm surge. The elements essentially accommodate another two to almost three feet of sea level rise beyond the present day mean higher high water tidal datum. Uh, so that is uh, a resilience trait that buys you time um, so that the structural elements will continue to provide an appropriate level of, of wave energy reduction uh, even as sea levels continue to the rise. And some of the higher elevation areas that are built into the marsh complexes in the upland of White Island uh, would be appropriate um, migration areas for some of the vegetation species uh, to adjust to higher future sea level datums. Uh, useful life for the as-built performance is beyond 2050. And we say it's likely somewhere in the range of the year 2068 to 2088. And the reason why there's a range is because that, you know, the as-built performance will change according to what future sea levels uh, rise scenario we end up following. Now the project may become completely submerged or project elements like the breakwaters may become submerged by the year 2063 under an extreme sea level rise acceleration scenario or as late as 2084 under a more likely sea level rise scenario. Uh, breakwaters are intentionally wide at the top to accept more stone. And so as an adaptive management uh, feature of the site, instead of having to rebuild everything, uh, you can buy yourself some additional capacity by just adding a layer of stone to the top of the structures uh, to keep pace with sea level rise. The intertidal marsh complexes have an additional two to three feet of accommodation space in terms of elevation for these uh, marsh vegetation species to uh, retreat to. Um, as they adjust to future sea levels. 
this is a selection of potential sea level rise um, future scenarios for Pensacola Bay. Uh, and what future curve we follow uh, is still anybody's guess. We probably won't know what trajectory we're on until about the year 2050. But the good news is that between now and 2050, there's not a remarkable divergence uh, across these different scenarios, at least not in a way that would significantly impact project performance. But we're currently right here in terms of time. Uh, and according to the Pensacola Bay tide gauge uh, and the long-term sea level trends, right now we tend to be following more of the intermediate uh, to slightly intermediate high sea level rise scenario. Looking out into the future, this is generally the range in which uh, our project performance in terms of the ability of the breakwaters to function as design uh, becomes somewhat in question. Uh, and really the, the early time frame is related to a, a more aggressive extreme sea level rise scenario. And of course the later times would be uh, more uh, uh, moderate sea level rise scenarios. We can also look in terms of um, you know, the, the resilience of the project to actual observed water levels in Pensacola Bay. Uh, and if we do that, we see that essentially our project is, is incorporating uh, or accommodating um, resilience to a, a fairly extreme event. Now, we said earlier that it was designed to a 10-year return period storm event, uh, but that 10-year return period storm event uh, is essentially, uh, you know, uh, based on the development of statistics and probabilities through storms that actually haven't happened, but statistically could. Uh, these are actual water levels that have happened over the past 80 to 90 years in Pensacola Bay. And so we see that our project design is actually a lot more resilient than we're giving it credit for. And in fact, uh, some of the elements that we're designing here, like the, the emergent breakwater structures, are probably more resilient even up to a, a 1% uh, annual chance event um, in terms of actual measured water levels in Pensacola Bay. Uh, if we follow a more aggressive sea level rise scenario, um, the frequency of occurrence of, of that event may change from 1% in a given year to 4% in a given year. So unless we end up following an extremely um, uh, uh, rapid increase in sea level rise scenario, uh, we won't see much change in performance over the life of the project. Uh, we have performed numerical modeling to uh, support the project design. Uh, that was done using a numerical model called XBeach, uh, which was developed out of uh, um, the Netherlands by a company called Delteris. Uh, and it is a, um, a fully two-dimensional model that that models the flow and the waves and the movement of the sediment and it changes to the project elements as a result of storm events. Um, so we're also modeling kind of average conditions uh, to see how things respond on, on a more slowly, a slow time scale. Uh, and we're using the model results uh, to, to inform some of the design elements for the breakwaters and the rock piles and the submerged breakwaters and the marshes and things like that. We're actually modeling Hurricane Sally as a prototypical storm event, uh, since it generally has a 10-year return period um, uh, characterization or probability. Um, there were some impacts to these sites as a result of the 2020 hurricane season, and so we're, we're gonna show you some of these by comparing the images from 2019 and, and 2020. So this is the project design um, as we described earlier in the presentation, uh, overlaying on 2019 aerial imagery. Uh, and this is what the project elements look like relative to uh, the post-Sally imagery. Now, you can see that a lot of White Island is missing. Um, now, these photos may be a little bit misleading because uh, they were taken so quickly after the passage of the storm that the water levels are still a little bit high uh, in the bay. Uh, but nevertheless, you can see um, going back and forth uh, just how much uh, the site has changed. Now, of course, the water's not as clear either. Um, so you've got a lot of sediment stirred up in the bay after the storm. So you're not seeing some of the shallow areas that we normally would on a, on a clear water day. Uh, but uh, this gives you some perspective at, at how things have changed as a result of just one year of hurricanes. 
Uh, looking at site B, um, again, comparing 2019 and 2020, uh, going back and forth, you don't see a huge change here. Um, again, the, the water is darker, and you're not seeing some of the shallow areas, um, but this is generally what the project design looks like uh, on top of more recent aerial imagery. Uh, and then at Site C at Sherman Inlet, uh, just kind of stepping through some select photo arrays, uh, you, you'll have some color-coded green and yellow areas to use for reference um, in the images. Uh, moving in time, uh, progression from left to right from 2019, to pre-Sally in the middle, to post-Sally and post-Zeta on the right. Uh, you can see uh, the amount that things have changed here at Site C uh, over time, um, just over the period of a little bit more than a year. Uh, this is looking um, towards the intercoastal waterway uh, in Robertson or Sand or Admirals Island. Again, you can kind of see the changes at the site. Um, of course, there have been some dramatic changes to Sherman Inlet in terms of its location. Uh, it, it breached and built up in one area and, and found a new outlet in another. Uh, and these are you know, some of the, the model data uh, that come out of the storm modeling uh, that are used to inform the design of the project elements where you're looking at essentially a recreation of the water level and wave conditions from Hurricane Sally. And this is just a, a slightly different view of, of what those uh, results look like. Um, if we were to look at, say, the waves on the left and uh, water levels, uh, and then uh, some of the velocities on the right. And the little feature that you see at the bottom uh, middle of the, the image is the, the tip of magazine point. Um, and then the uh, blue thing sticking out to the right of it is going to be the, the existing jetty. Uh, so we use the model to not only ensure that the project design uh, will function um, as we hope and as we intend, uh, but also to see and inform um, some decisions on how the, the site might change over time in response to, to more average conditions. There's just some uh, brief animations of, of what some of the modeling output looks like. Um, if we were to animate it, uh, and essentially what you're looking at is a recreation of the conditions um, that were experienced during Hurricane Sally, where you get an increase in water levels and waves, and then a corresponding increase in velocities in and out of the site. So next steps of the project include permit submission. Um, that's what we're working on right now. Uh, as a part of that, that permitting process, there will be a public comment period um, where there's a, a comment period that's essentially facilitated or managed by Corps of Engineers. Uh, we would then resolve um, all comments received through the permitting process that would include comments from the state, comments from federal agencies, and comments submitted by the public. Uh, finalizing the borrow area and dredging plans uh, for the sites and updating project designs and specifications as needed. Uh, based on um, uh, the permitting process, and then of course updating project costs. So this concludes uh, the update for the 60% design. Uh, additional information about the project can be found at the website linked um, or shown on the slide. Uh, and then of course the contact information uh, for your county representatives uh, on this project uh, are provided there on the slide as well. Thank you very much. This concludes the 60% design presentation.